Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. Bob Zellick is with us. Bob Zellick is the former Deputy Secretary of State, the United States Trade Representative, and President of the World Bank. He has written a dynamite book entitled America in the World, a history of US diplomacy and foreign policy. He is here to tell us about it and to tell us how history is relevant to today's events. We're very much honored to have Bob Zellick with us. Congratulations on your book, Bob. It was really a marvelous read. Uh, America in the World, an engaging title. Uh, and so my opening question is, uh, why did you write this book? And particularly, why did you decide to release it now? Well, first, thanks for having me, Jim. And thanks for the nice words about the book. So uh, when I was in, in government over many different posts over the years, I, I often drew upon history as I thought about problems. And so I wanted to encourage others, particularly younger generations, uh, to have that perspective. Um, as you probably know, many foreign policy courses these days are taught with international relations theories. And they're fun to play with and debate, but frankly, I didn't find them of much use when I was dealing with issues such as German unification or China or Darfur or trade policy. And so what I want to do in, what I wanted to do in this book was to focus on the practical problem solving nature. Now you probably recall, Henry Kissinger wrote a book titled Diplomacy in the 90s where he talked about history and with foreign policy. But knowing Dr. Kissinger it tended to focus on the European real politic tradition. And in this book, I wanted to talk about American experience uh, and, and ideas. And I suppose uh, over the years, I've often worked with younger colleagues that maybe I used to torture a little bit with historical questions because I didn't know how much they knew. And I discovered insofar as they had learned about American history and foreign policy, it tended to be from World War II on. So they really didn't have a sense of the first 150 years, which has some fascinating uh, figures and, and incidents. So as you know, what I try to do in the book is each chapter is about uh, a person or a group of people and a particular problem. So while I cover some 200 diff different years, um, it starts with Ben Franklin and goes all the way up to George Bush 41 and 92. And then I have an afterword that looks at the more recent president. Okay, so you start with uh, Benjamin Franklin, who uh, you say invented American diplomacy, but chapter one is about Alexander Hamilton occupying the room where it happened. And um, he intrigued you a great deal because he was really the first American to relate economics to foreign policy. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about him? Well, that's exactly right. So I, I'm starting with the Secretary of the Treasury as opposed to Secretary of State. And I suppose that's a little different than some foreign policy books. Um, the interesting uh, anecdote about uh, Hamilton is that in, in 1781, so the Revolutionary War is still going on, he, he's left Washington staff, he retreats to the library of his father-in-law, and he's trying to understand what are sort of the fundamentals of the war with Britain. And he, and he focuses on the importance of financial credit in a war of attrition. And he recognizes that that will be the key to success. And he applies that when he becomes Secretary of Treasury. He understands that credit is an asset. And of course, one of the ironies is the good credit that he establishes allows his rival, Thomas Jefferson, to buy Louisiana uh, in 1803. But he also brings, he has a notion about systems of power, economic, military, how they fit together. And he has a, a strategic outlook. Uh, this is not an isolationist by any means. He understands how the new United States fits in the Atlantic world. He understands the importance of the Mississippi River Valley. So he has a sense of land and maritime power. And one of the little incidents I talk about in the book is he, he starts with what today we would call a strategic dialogue with Britain. And you know, he's really offering the idea that the young United States, even though we just fought a war with Britain, could fit within the trading system of Britain as a partner. And the British prime minister at that time, Lord Shelburne had a similar idea, but they're both about hundred years ahead of their time. The politics won't permit it. And so that what leads Hamilton to pursue the policy that we then learned, uh, came to know as neutrality. He wanted to avoid conflicts with, with Europe. And there was a real basic reason, which is remember, he puts together the financial system. About 90% of America's revenues are based on the customs fees. 
So if we get into a war and conflict that cuts off trade, there's no money to fund the government or, or to pay the debts. So I try to connect the domestic economic agenda he had with his foreign policy. So uh, we always adhere to those traditions? Lately, we seem to have gotten away from them. Yes, well, as, as, we, as we mentioned, the, the book is about individuals and cases, but I use those five traditions to try to draw together the various stories. And just to take the first one, North America that you mentioned, you know, if you look on websites of various foreign policy institutes, you'll find a lot on Europe and Asia and Middle East and some even on Latin America and Africa, almost rarely do we discuss North America. And yet it was obviously important uh, in the 19th century. If you think of the 20th century, we almost went to war again with Mexico. Uh, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis in the Caribbean, the big nuclear showdown, NAFTA and the changing relationship with Mexico. And if you ask many Americans today what most interests them in foreign policy, you'll probably hear topics such as immigration, uh, organized crime and narcotics, uh, economic relationships, um, and that's the heart of the North American agenda. But the other point I wanted to make on this was one that Ronald Reagan made in 1979 as he was launching his presidential campaign. It's almost inconceivable today. He said, you know, we'd be better off if Mexico and Canada were stronger. And it's time that we stop thinking about our nearest neighbors as foreigners. So he was building on the notion that a stronger North America would help the United States be stronger globally, and which is another point. If you think about 500 million people, three democracies, better demographics than the rest of the world, energy self-sufficiency, ability to export, if we treat our labor force and human resources as, as, uh, as, as a form of capital that we invest in as opposed to a problem. So number one, you have to think about North America and the bigger point. The trade point you mentioned, is important because from the very start of the United States, Americans are thinking about trade as more than a matter of economic efficiency. It's how we interconnect with the world. And because we're starting out as a young republic in a world of empires, we're doing it through the private sector, which is a critical aspect of America's role. Then third, the one about alliances and order. For the first 150 years, going back to Washington's caution about avoiding permanent alliances, and Jefferson's warning about entangling alliances, we avoid alliances like the plague. And so much of American foreign policy is, how do you connect in the world without alliances? But then from 1947 to 49, we create a new alliance system. It's a, it's a fresh approach. And for the next 70 to 80 years, that's what guide policy. And that'll be an issue of, of what we do today. The fourth one that you also mentioned is, many foreign policy experts tend to forget <laughs> that we do this in a democracy. George Kennan, you could see why they never wanted to let him talk to people on the Hill because he was devastating about the role of Congress. And yet successful policies have to be grounded in basic public support. And I draw this out with Senator Vandenberg in the 47, 49 period. But if you think about people like McCain or Luger or others, it's a question for today. And the last one you mentioned, I, I use America's purpose as opposed to exceptionalism for a very conscious reason. Many countries will see themselves as exceptional, but the best anecdote that I found to explain this notion of purpose is for those of you that still carry wallets, someday take out a dollar bill and look at the back. And you may not have ever looked at it very closely, but you'll see the great seal of the United States. On the reverse side, you have this unfinished pyramid and note it's unfinished. The eye of providence above it and below it, novus ordo seclum new order of the ages. So from the start, these people were thinking about big ideas, but then the notion of that purpose changes over time. And it's always a combination of the context in the world, public support, and some idea of a higher purpose. And that of course is the challenge that a Biden faces today. Well, uh, I, I did notice that um, on the uh, reverse side of the dollar bill, uh, there's an American eagle, and the American eagle holds in one hand a quiver of arrows, and the other hand uh, an olive branch, and is looking toward the olive branch. We prefer peace to war. But during the Vietnam War, uh, they constructed a sculpture in front of the American embassy in London, and the eagle is looking at uh, the quiver of arrows. So uh, sometimes it's war, and sometimes it's peace. Yeah, well, that's definitely the case about the American tradition. And one of the points I try to draw out in my chapter in Vietnam 
And it's a point that Kissinger has also made is Americans tend to look upon fighting wars and peace as separate and discrete events and not sort of recognize the interconnections. And in reality, if you go back even to the Franklin story, you know, he's, he's trying to have a diplomacy with France and do a treaty with Britain based on the war fighting, whether it be the victory in Saratoga or, or uh, Yorktown. Jefferson uses the threat against the French about militia marching on New Orleans in part to do his, his purchase. So one of the challenges of American diplomacy is this in interconnection between war, use of force, and the peace. Well, you mentioned uh, many uh, important figures in history and in our diplomatic history in the book. Um, and it'd be fair to call uh, them diplomats. Uh, most of them, uh, uh, like yourself, would seem to be uh, uh, lawyers or uh, reform lawyers uh, who went into the uh, uh, august profession of diplomacy. But you have a very interesting uh, chapter on Van Eva Bush who was not a diplomat, was not a lawyer, he was a scientist. And uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about his important role. I think during, uh, he was uh, Roosevelt's scientific advisor during World War II. And um, he uh, probably uh, predicted the, uh, the advent of the smartphone. He was years ahead of his time. Yeah, well, I'm glad you focused on him. Van Amber Bush is a person you won't find in many books on, <laughs> on foreign policy for the reason you said. But I wanted to include his chapter because he's the father of an economic statecraft that uh, is based on perpetual scientific and technological change. So we've talked a little bit about geopolitics. We've talked a little bit about economics. And what I wanted to stress was that science and technology has been important and I think will be increasingly important in our larger diplomacy and foreign policy. So for people who wouldn't know Bush, he was a uh, very successful polymath engineer and inventor. He was a vice president at MIT. Um, he becomes head of the Carnegie Science Institution of the endowment, which is kind of the platform where in World War II, he basically maneuvers himself into a situation where he is uh, trying to fuse the technology and science profession with war fighting. And, of course, he becomes the key liaison with the atom bomb, but it's important with proximity fuse development, important with radar. He develops an operational research capacity that helps defeat U-boats using uh, both technology and, and intelligence systems. But then his real reputation in the scientific field was that in 1944, he works with the White House to have Roosevelt ask him to write about America's post-war science policy. And in 1945, he produces a book, a uh, report called Science, the Endless Frontier. So notice we're now moving beyond geographic frontiers to the notion of science and, and technology. And he basically presents the structure for what at Stanford is called the triple helix system, basic research by the US government involving universities, but also the private sector. And he gets into a lot of different fights. In some ways, his design doesn't turn out the way that he wants. But in my view, it's very important in our competition with the Soviet Union in the Cold War, with our command economy not being able to keep up with technology in the 80s. It'll be important in our competition with China. But also that chapter draws in the fact that some experience I had as early as 1992 when I was the president's lead for the Global Climate Change Framework Treaty, the only one that the Senate has ever ratified about how you take these scientific topics and connect them to foreign policy and diplomacy. So if you're thinking about climate change or you're thinking about biological security today and pandemics, these will be a crucial uh, issue. And then the last point, the one you mentioned, which also is, is, is just so good you can't make this up. In July of 40, 1945, he issues this report. He sees the atomic test bla uh, blast in New Mexico. But then there's a third one, which is he writes an article in the Atlantic, where he imagines something he calls a Memex machine. And in effect, he's imagining an early personal computer because it's the, and remember, we were just getting used to big computers, much less desktop ones. And it turns out that a young radar technician goes off to the Philippines, comes across a reprint of the article in a Red Cross library in Leyte on, on stilts, commits himself to becoming one of America's pioneers for the personal computer. And indeed, 
one of Bush's graduate students helps found Silicon Valley as provost of Stanford. So you have this wonderful figure and it shows the interconnections of these experiences over decades. Um, you are kind of lukewarm in the book on Woodrow Wilson. Now, many have said that Franklin D. Roosevelt and his internationalist policies, as well as indeed his domestic policies would not have been possible without Woodrow Wilson. Um, is your uh, uh, lukewarm attitude toward uh, Wilson uh, because of his uh, contemptible attitudes toward race? Well, that is part of his, his legacy that he has to bear. But in that chapter, I focus on the period from 1914 to 17, where the world is at war, World War I has started, but the US is out of it, and kind of how the US gets drawn into the nature of the conflict and how he explains it to the American people. And when you talk about his effect on Franklin Roosevelt, and even frankly, Nixon had Wilson's portrait uh, in, in, his, uh, in the Oval Office, Wilson had some very appealing visions and he wasn't bad on tactics. Where I fault him is, and I'd use this in this chapter to draw it out, is what I call the area in between, the operational art, how you try to connect the ideas with the practice. And in particular, I draw attention to something that a friend of mine, Phil Zellico, has now published in a book just recently about whether there might have been an effort to mediate a peace in late 1916, early 17. And what I saw is that Wilson, unlike Teddy Roosevelt, by the way, who's mediated peace in Asia and in Europe 10 years earlier, Wilson just doesn't know how to do it. He, he's, he's good at giving speeches, but he, and frankly, his, his staff, Colonel House, Secretary of State Lansing, they don't really help him. In fact, they hurt him. And so I use that to kind of show that while Wilson had some very uh, positive visions and wasn't bad on tactics, quite effective as a domestic politician, he missed this operational art in between. And again, part of the purpose of the book is to help people understand experiences and ideas so they can think about that applicability today. Um, another American tendency over the years has been isolationism. I mean, perhaps you mentioned it, it might, might have started with George Washington beware of alliances and Jefferson beware entangling alliances. Uh, and uh, there had, was certainly a tendency in the United States in the 1930s to not to get involved in Europe. Uh, and then we moved to Donald Trump with America first and uh, a disentanglement from all the alliances which had built up since the end of World War II. How do you see uh, Trump's foreign policy of America first is fitting in with uh, the five traditions that uh, are kind of the matrix of your book? Well, you know, Jim, the, the most fundamental part about Trump's presidency to me is, you know, I, I've had the opportunity to actually to work with a number of presidents in both parties. And while these are people of strong egos and sense of self, they always have a sense that the country is larger than themselves. And I don't, I don't think Trump had that. I mean, in its most fundamental sense, he's unwilling to accept a peaceful transfer of power. He's challenging the fundamentals of the constitution. This is really a form of sedition. And what could be more basic to American policy, either foreign or domestic? And certainly one of the appeals America's had to the world is we have this resilient system that <clears throat> while we disagree and we'll have difficult fights, still people have to come together and accept the democratic system. That's pretty fundamental to me for foreign as well as domestic policy. As a practical matter, and this fits his nature, Trump was totally transactional. It was all deals, as opposed to understanding, as you mentioned, kind of the connection of actions to building systems, alliances, things that have a longer life, similar with our, our economic arrangements. And then, you know, his, his foreign policy, in a sense, became an extension of the political image he wanted to create. He wanted to be a disruptor. He wanted to sort of challenge all the existing order. And so part of his authenticity with his domestic support on something like the wall with Mexico was that was a way of highlighting his anti-immigration policy. So when he couldn't get funding, you know, uh, some people thought, oh, well, that'll be the end. I always suspect that he'll try to do something because he can't walk away from that issue. Similar with trade and protectionism. It was his way of trying to sort of seal things off from the world. And then of course, the last piece is no surprise. This is sort of the uh, master narcissist. <laughs> and, and so when it comes time to dealing with other human beings, 
he actually seems to fare better with authoritarian figures than he does with democratic leaders who have to also deal with publics. So, you know, I see Trump as a serious break with the past. But, you know, he, he's reflecting a mood in the country that, you know, is still part of our political culture today. Okay, so uh, we have an election. Trump loses, Biden wins. That's a fact like the weather. Uh, and Biden is in office and he goes to the State Department and he says America is back. Now that hints at a, an activist foreign policy. And now, is that something you think will have the support of the American people and the Congress? Well, you know, when I think about the Biden administration, it actually reminds me of an incident with my former boss, James Baker, when he was secretary or was chief of staff to Reagan in 1981. And he said, Mr. President, you have three priorities, economic recovery, economic recovery, and economic recovery. So for President Biden, the top priority is dealing with the pandemic and the economic recovery. He also, as we know, has a huge domestic agenda. And with his experience in Congress, he knows how much time this takes. So to go to your point, while Biden is experienced in the world, wants to have an international role, I think people have to recognize that how he does this you know, may involve some priorities and allocation of time. Not surprisingly, his first efforts tend to focus on the international aspects of his domestic agenda. So some foreign policy people would call this transnationalism. So the immigration issue, where I think, frankly, he's running into a little trouble. Um, we've seen over the past week what I'll call the pandemic and biological security issue. And again, I think he was a little slow to recognize the international dimensions. Climate will be another one. Now, if he gets that right, it's early. This is actually a good way to build stronger relationships with other people around the world uh, and, and to build partnerships. But we'll, we'll have to see how that works. He's, he's focusing, unlike Trump, on rebuilding the ties with allies and partners. I think that's a smart thing. But you know, you've been around the track a few times, Jim. You've seen, you know, Harold McMillan had this wonderful line when he was elected. He was asked, well, what are your priorities or your plans? And he said, events, dear boy, events. <clears throat> and as you know, events are often what drive things. So we'll have to see what comes out of the withdrawal from Afghanistan, kind of his approach to Russia, you know, the Iran deal, they're trying to go back into it, but there's sort of leftover issues from the past about Iran's behavior and missiles and the length of the deal. Ultimately, this will be the two big issues of the future of free societies and dealing with China. But then to close with the question you closed with, will the American public support it? What's quite interesting is if you look at surveys such as the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, Americans are not isolationists. They understand the importance of allies, the international economy, trade, these transnational issues. But on the other hand, these are somewhat um, inchoate attitudes. And it's always been the case for Franklin Roosevelt or Teddy Roosevelt or any Wilson. How does a president shape them, both with a combination of explanations, but I think equally important actions, you know, what demonstrates things to the world? So that will be what to watch for the Biden administration. Well, in your judgment, was it a good idea for Biden to announce he was uh, withdrawing uh, 2,500 troops from Afghanistan? It seems to have opened a Pandora's box of violence. It's a very close call because here's, here's, here's the problem. Number one, um, there's a serious risk the government will collapse and, and that will look like a defeat. Um, you have to be prepared for humanitarian problems and, and refugees. You know, whether to be cold-blooded about it, while the American public may uh, not like that, they can probably live with it. The third one that is more troublesome would be um, if it eventually is used as a base for attacking the United States again, as we saw with 9-11. With it's hard to sort of guess the probability of that. On the other hand, to be fair to Biden, we've been there 20 years. People are tired of this. You know, at some point, the United States needs to sort of say, look, you know, we've made every effort we can. We now need to extricate ourselves. I probably would have argued because we hadn't, as I recall, lost a person over the past year. I would have argued for some continued small presence. It probably would have helped us as a base in the region, would have helped avoid some of those downside risks. But I can understand in some ways respect the gutsiness of his call about saying, you know, it was time to close this chapter. Okay, so uh, very sadly, we've run out of time because this has been quite fascinating, but I have a question for you, Bob Zellick. Uh, 
And uh, the question is, will Biden succeed in putting America back in the world? Well, I hope he will. I hope all Americans uh, you know, would encourage him uh, to do so. Uh, but I think uh, for the reasons that I mentioned, I think uh, there's, it's too early to say whether he will be successful. My major concern is because of domestic party politics, he's going very slow on trade and international economics. And so while he's taking step, other steps that I would be supportive of, my view of the world and in East Asia is that if we're not sitting at the table helping to make those rules, we're out of the game. And I think that's very bad for the United States. So that's, I just wrote something in the Wall Street Journal actually that tries to encourage him to up his game on that one. So early to tell, but slow to make the rules. Bob Zellick, thank you so much for coming by. Thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care, be well, and all the best.